Okay, great. Well, I think it's it's time that we can get started now. Thank you everyone for, for being here today. It's wonderful to see such a large group as I see names keep popping up on the side of the screen of people joining. It's, it's wonderful to have so many of you here for this really important um, discussion that we're going to have. My name is Marshall Lee Taylor and I'm going to be the moderator for our conversation this afternoon or this evening, depending on, on where, where we all are in, in the country. Um, as most of you probably know by now, today is National Fentanyl Awareness Day. And this is the second ever activation to spread awareness and information about the fentanyl crisis in our country. This session today is the, the final in a five part series of educational webinars about various aspects of the, the fentanyl issue um, from all sorts of different perspectives. If any of you missed the earlier sessions, all of them are being recorded and you'll be able to find them um, on the National Fentanyl Awareness Day website, as well as the Song for Charlie website. We're so grateful for the more than 700 organizations that have partnered on this Awareness Day. Um, it's so critical that we have so many nonprofits throughout the country, corporations, um, uh, different individuals uh, and influencers joining their voices to make sure that we are making as many people aware as possible about the risk of fentanyl in the drug supply. Um, and we're, we thank them all for um, lending their names and, and lending their voices to this important cause. We have two incredibly impressive speakers with us um, today, Don Burke and Howard Jalal, to present their research findings on the predictable patterns of drug overdose deaths. Um, their work is gonna help us really rethink all of the headlines. Uh, you know, we tend to think about the drug issue in silos. So right now we're very focused on the fentanyl crisis. In the 80s, we were focused on the crack epidemic. Um, but what you're going to hear from them in a few minutes is really how this is part of more than a 40 year trend of an exponential increase in overdose deaths. And I think it's going to make us all um, really think critically about how we're looking at today's crisis. Um, my background is in drug policy, both at the, at the, well, at the national level, both on Capitol Hill as well as national nonprofits. And after their presentation, we're gonna have a discussion about what the implications are for policymakers and really what the implications are for how we think about how to address this problem um, more broadly than just looking at it in a drug specific way. So without further ado, I will introduce our panelists. Um, Dr. Don Burke is Dean Emeritus and Distinguished University Professor of Health Science and Policy at the Graduate School of Public Health at the University of Pittsburgh. He is also co-founder and president of Epistemics, a startup company spun out of his epidem epidemic modeling research. Over the course of his career, he has been affiliated with Walter Reed, Johns Hopkins, the National Academy of Medicine, and has advised the WHO, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, the CDC, and more. Dr. Burke is among the top infectious disease experts in the world and the author of 320 scientific articles on prevention and control of epidemics of global importance, including HIV, influenza, uh, encephalitis viruses, hepatitis A, and coronavirus. He received his BA from Western Reserve University and his MD from Harvard Medical School. We are also joined today by Dr. Hari Jalal, uh, who is an Associate Professor and Canada Research Chair in the Health Economics um, at the School of Epidemiology and Public Health at the University of Ottawa. He has also been an Associate Professor at the University of Pittsburgh and a Postdoctoral Fellow at Stanford. Dr. Dalal's area of expertise involves health substance use and cancer modeling, as well as quantitative data analytics and mathematical modeling. His work has been published in leading journals, including Science, Nature Medicine, International Journal on Drug Policy, Addiction, and Epidemiology. Dr. Jalal was born in Kurdistan, Iraq, where he practiced medicine for three years prior to beginning his graduate studies at the University of Minnesota on a Fulbright scholarship. Dr. Burke and Dr. Jalal are going to um, give a presentation on their data, uh, and then we'll have a conversation about their findings. And I encourage everyone to submit um, questions as you think of them using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, and without further ado, uh, we'll go to the presentation and look forward to hearing about your research. 
Great. Well, thank you, Marsha. Hare, could you uh, put up the slides, please? Yeah. Uh, do you see my screen now? I do. And let me minimize mine over here. So today uh, we're going to be talking about predictable patterns of drug overdose deaths, and particularly does fentanyl follow the rules? Next slide. Um, and I'll summarize uh, what we're going to talk about here, uh, that there are four predictable patterns that we're calling the rules of drug overdose deaths in the United States. First, there is a long-term exponential growth pattern. Second, an annual increasing pattern of where it uh, ratchets up uh, each year. Third, a monthly oscillation. And fourth, uh, the rate increases in every successive birth year cohort. And we'll walk through each of these and explain them one by one and their significance. In the big picture, next slide, why is this important? Well, a better understanding of the causes of these patterns will lead to improved control policies. And then at a minimum, even if we can't fully understand the causes, greater awareness of the patterns will improve policy evaluations as we'll illustrate. Next, please. So we're going to ask, does fentanyl follow these rules uh, or is fentanyl different? Rule one is exponential growth of overdose deaths. And by exponential growth, let me distinguish exponential growth from linear growth. Linear growth is just one, two, three, four in order um, in, uh, in, in a line, whereas exponential growth is growing uh, with the multiplication by itself, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, like compound interest in a bank account. Next slide, please. Well, um, exactly uh, six years ago today, uh, we put a paper in a, a preprint um, uh, site online called BioArchives, uh, where we made a note that said that when we looked back over the drug overdose deaths from accidental drug overdose deaths from 1979 through 2015, uh, that, and we plotted that as the dark circles, that we could fit a mathematical line to that, uh, that was an exponential curve. And the formula for that exponential curve is shown in red above. Uh, and in fact, that was a very tight statistical, uh, making it very unlikely that this was a chance observation. And it wasn't just a figure of speech when we say it was exponential, it was almost perfectly exponential. Next, please. So we then set out to forecast uh, the number of potential accidental overdose deaths based on this mathematical curve. Um, and in that bioarchives paper, uh, we said, here are the likely number of overdose deaths between 2016 and 2020 by taking that curve and just projecting it into the future. Um, and uh, uh, at that time, we had no, no certainty you know, that the, what the curve would look like. All we had was the historical past um, 37 years of near perfect exponential growth. And it made sense that it, that would likely continue into the future. Next, please. Um, but the, the next year, we, um, we, we did a more in-depth study other than uh, this, uh, this note in bioarchives where we published a paper in science where we not only looked at the total exponential growth, but we looked at the causes of uh, overdose deaths, accidental overdose deaths, you know, from each of a number of uh, individual drugs shown here. Uh, the uh, the legend says heroin, prescription opioids, methadones, synthetic opioids, which um, meaned at the essentially fentanyl and fentanyl derivatives, cocaine, unspecified narcotics, methamphetamine, and unspecified drugs. Uh, and the overall smooth and predictable pattern was composed of these combi a combination of these several distinct rising and falling patterns of individual drugs. So that's sort of a paradox in that, how can you get such a, a smooth curve combined of these seemingly um, unpredictable rises and falls? But that's what we saw, that we do have a paradox here. Next, please. 
some of the more prominent uh, changes over time were there was a significant cocaine surge in 2006 and the curve for fentanyl uh, and other and the synthetic opioids began to curve up uh, in 2014. Next, please. So we made this prediction uh, based on data through 2015. Uh, and let's now take a look at how accurate was the overall forecast based on the extrapolation of the curve of the overdose deaths. Next, please. And here is the, uh, the results uh, for the next uh, six and a half years. Seven years isn't quite finished, but we made a, an estimate based on the available data. Uh, the part which is the uh, the observed data in 2015 is the uh, solid black circles and the red dotted line, uh, and then everything forecast that is in the gray zone to the right. Um, and you can see there our forecast for the first five years are those circles, and now uh, more recently we've extended that forecast beyond five years to go on to 10 years uh, through uh, through 2020, uh, and then we. Um, uh, plotted the actual recorded data for the first five years and then the next uh, two years. And so the seven years, you can see that uh, that uh, we have this continued increase uh, that has fit uh, quite well to the overall forecast. And we'll go through some of these reasons there. It's not a perfect fit, but it's a pretty good fit. So next slide, please. Uh, fentanyl started as we looked at the last uh, slide. We saw it began in 2014. So fentanyl is uh, just picked up with this exponential curve uh, that had already been ongoing for 37 years. Next, please. But the curve is uh, isn't exactly exponential. There are some what we call wobbles in the curve. Uh, the uh, and you can see there are, um, just by uh, eyeball examination, you can see there are three main wobbles from uh, that deviate from a perfect exponential growth fit. And so we can ask, what, what can we learn from these wobbles about the ab our ability to forecast? Next, please. Well, remember that, uh, that uh, Harry, could you go back one? I should have pointed out. So that we have these two, these three separate wobbles, number one, number two, and number three. And what we'll do is we'll look at each of these wobbles in turn to see what we know about what caused that particular aberration uh, or deviation from exponential growth. Next, please. So uh, wobble number one is uh, was strongly associated with the 2006 surge of cocaine, uh, mostly urban. Uh, and uh, uh, but that came and went. Next uh, next wobble was wobble number two. Um, Howard and I have studied this in some detail about what happened uh, in 2017. And as it turns out that the, those states that had the most law enforcement seizures of carfentanil were the uh, the states that had the greatest increase in deaths in 2017. And there was almost a perfect correlation. States that had a high amount of carfentanil had a high amount of excess overdose deaths. So the second excess deaths, the wobble number two, was this carfentanil in five states. Next, please. Um, this is a slightly different plot than what we showed before. The previous plots were shown the data year by year. And this now breaks it into month by month uh, from the years uh, 1999 uh, through uh, 2022. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the, the plot is monthly, not yearly. Uh, and as you go up the curve, the red line is the exponential growth and the curve of the monthly numbers deviate around that a bit, but stay within the confidence bounds. Uh, and then in uh, and by the way, you can see the carfentanil surge in 2017 there. Uh, yeah, thanks, Ari. Uh, and then it dropped, but then it started to go back up again. And then COVID hit. Uh, and now we've, we've had uh, two distinct major bumps uh, in major increases in um, drug overdose deaths uh, during that time period. 
so that wobble number three was due to COVID. And, and so we have some current research that we're trying to figure out exactly how that happened. Next, please. So we have uh, three wobbles, the 2006 cocaine wobble, the 2017 carfentanil, and the 2021. And so why, why do we make a big deal out of this? Well, in each case, when it went up, the cases came down, but they came back down to the exponential curve and then started back up again. Uh, and it's as if the uh, when it uh, the 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 case the death rates deviate from the expected curve, uh, it snaps back to the predictable exponential trajectory. Next, please. Well, one of the consequences of this is that government officials are tempted to interpret each short-term down downward phase of a wobble as signifying a long-term success. Next, please. So here's the, our curve again. Uh, and on the right uh, is a quote from President Trump in the 2020 State of the Union Address. With unyielding commitment, we are curbing the ep opioid epidemic. Drug overdose deaths declined for the first time in 30 years which uh, everyone was very pleased. Uh, but then you'll notice that the curve started back up again in 2019, and this was before COVID. So that uh, the, the, the curve uh, adhered to this exponential growth process. So next please, and to show just not to be partisan about the issue, Dr. Gupta just earlier this year uh, said, but for the last two years, the Biden-Harris administration has taken historic steps. As a result, today's data continue to show a decrease in overdose deaths for the first for the fifth month in a row. Uh, but and although we don't can't prove it yet, um, it seems likely that the curve will start back up again. Next, please. So uh, rule number one is that overdose deaths have been increasing along a predictable exponential trajectory for at least 43 years. And do we ask, does fentanyl follow this rule? And the answer is yes. So now let's turn uh, to the other rules. Um, and Hare, uh, will you take it from here, please? Yes, uh, thank you, Marsha. Thank you, Don. Um, so now we're gonna talk about rules two, three, and four. So rule two is the drug overdose deaths follow an annual cycle. And um, so if you look at these uh, detrended data, so this is the same monthly data compared against the exponential curve. So here we flatten it just to show the monthly data. And we repeated the trend like three times just to show the patterns. What you can see is that it's not regular. Um, it's not constantly high or low. What happens is, is it increases in uh, early in the year. So it increased in January and February and then drops down. Uh, and then there's a spike in July and then goes down. Um, and then the same cycle happens over and over again. So this pattern of monthly uh, changes in overdose deaths, uh, when we plot it back on the exponential curve, you can see like it looks like a ratchet. So it goes up, it stays up for a, little, for a while. So it stays steady and then goes down a bit and then goes up again. And then same cycle happens over and over again. Now, um, whether the cycle is important or not uh, depends on the causal and the drivers uh, that are driving the, those factors. Uh, like if we study these patterns and what's driving the increase in certain months of the year, that could probably pr provide potential for policy uh, interventions. Um, so does um, a drug overdose deaths follow an annual ratchet-like cycle, which peaks in January to February and, and adheres in at, success, at successively higher levels in November to December. Does fentanyl follow this rule? And the answer is yes. So right before 2014, this monthly cycles were happening, these annual cycles were happening, and then after 2014, they continue to happen when fentanyl has dominated. And uh, similar trends is also the monthly uh, mor uh, mortality. So if you go to rule number three, monthly cycles of overdose deaths, you can see a similar pattern. Uh, that uh, here we show the monthly uh, changes in overdose deaths in each day of the month by three age categories. So age 18 to 34, 35 to 54, and age 55 plus. Again, we repeated the cycles three times to show the pattern. And what you can see is that the overdose deaths, depending on the age group, changes by about 10, plus minus 10% above the expected rate. 
in certain times of the month. So during the uh, first week of the month, it increases until it reaches the peak around day seven, and then it reaches the um, uh, the, uh, the the lowest point at day twenty one. And studying these patterns and studying those drivers about what happens uh, that causes the drug overdose deaths to increase early in the month and then drop later on can help also us prepare uh, better for policy implication and uh, curbing the epidemic. Um, so rule number three is also drug overdose deaths follow a monthly cycle with peaks in day seven and uh, mid years in day 21. So does the fentanyl follow its rule? And the answer is yes. So these patterns have been happening uh, before fentanyl was dominating in 2014. Now, uh, the fourth rule, which is our final rule, um, is that age-specific overdose death, death rate are occurring at a faster rate for every successive birth year cohort. So I'm gonna show as a graph that might be uh, look slightly complicated to look at, but if you follow a single birth year cohort, so here, for example, if you follow people who were born in 1940, you can see that their overdose mortality was uh, very low all through their life. So you have age on the, um, uh, on the bottom here. So if you follow them from age 20, 40, they're, they're, they have really small uh, number of overdose deaths. Now, if you follow the next, uh, like 10 uh, years later, to follow the birth year uh, 1950, these were people who were born in the year 1950, you follow them by, by, um, uh, through, through their lifetime, you can see that age by age, for each particular age, they were doing worse than people who were born uh, before them. And then if you continue doing that for people who are born 1951, 52, and so forth, you get to people who are born 1960, they were doing much worse than people who were born 1950. And this pattern has been happening, causing this kind of fanning of the overdose mortality by different age groups, which is, uh, this pattern is also contributing to overdose mortality and the exponential growth. But the drivers of why each birth year is doing worse than the birth year before it is really not known yet. Uh, but studying those patterns can also help us understand and uh, uh, combat uh, the epidemic. So going back to the point of fentanyl, uh, these patterns have been happening before fentanyl and after, after it. So here we have this kind of marking about when fentanyl became dominated. But you can see the growth what was happening before fentanyl and continues doing, uh, happening uh, after fentanyl as well. So uh, rule number four, age-specific overdose death uh, deaths are occurring at a faster rate for every uh, successive birth year cohort. Does fentanyl follow this rule? And the answer is yes. So we also have a, a modification of that rule as well, which is rule number four A, uh, possible age barriers to the youth ward shift of age-specific overdose uh, death rates. So we mentioned that for each birth year, it has uh, they were doing worse than the birth year before them. It looks like the starting point, the starting age for these um, trends have been age 18. So you can see the curves are, are kind of standing around age 18 as a turning point. But it looks like now, we've called this age 18, by the way, we are calling it um, the adolescent barrier. But in the more recently, it has been looked like that people are dying at the younger age groups. Uh, so like age uh, 17 and 16 are also, they are experiencing higher mortality rates than they used to uh, previously. So now this uh, takes us to rule number uh, uh, 4A. There's an age barrier for, or at least there was an age barrier for drug overdose deaths at ages younger than 18. Does fentanyl follow this rule? We are not certain yet because we don't have the data yet. Uh, there's a lag in the data. And also those, uh, some of the birth years have not reached that age yet. Uh, but we are not sure if fentanyl follows that rule just yet. So in summary, we had we discussed four rules or four patterns uh, for overdose mortality in the United States. Number one is the long-term exponential growth. Number two is the annual increasing ratchet-like pattern. Number three, the monthly oscillation pattern. And number four, the rate increase in every successive birth year cohort. And for all of these rules, it looks like the patterns have been existing before fentanyl and after fentanyl as well. Studying those patterns can help us address uh, the policies and target the policies toward important processes and important dynamics that can help curb the epidemic. And at the minimum, it can have uh, creating greater awareness for these patterns can help uh, improving the policy evaluations.
So thank you very much for your attention. And now I think we are opening up for uh, questions. Thank you so much. This is really fascinating research and is something that I don't, I don't think people generally um, think of drug overdose trends in this way. I think we, as I mentioned at the beginning, really tend to look at drug epidemics in a very siloed manner. Um, and what I find fascinating is that um, despite changes in demographics of who is using or the drugs, which drug they're using, and despite even decreases in certain drugs, you still have this this upward trajectory um, that is that is predictable as as you showed. So there it seems like there are forces greater than any substance, greater than what's going on in any one particular community that's going on. And Hari, at the end, you mentioned that you know we need to look into this more. You know, what type of research do you think that the federal government should be doing, your peers at other universities should be doing to try to really dig into this and understand this exponential increase and, and you know, persistent overdose problem that we're having in the United States? Howard, do you want to take it? Uh, sure. Yeah, I can. Uh, so, so I, I like, um, I, I am a mathematical modeler. I, I believe in in understanding dynamics of things, like drivers of uh, processes. And one of the things that um, uh, the Don and I have been talking about uh, like for, for a very long time now is uh, creating a uh, uh, like a research that looks into the drivers, like what is keeping people on those trajectories. Obviously, um, we, can't, uh, we can't continue looking at individual drugs uh, one at a time, uh, we have to look into the whole, uh, like the, um, the 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 picture holist more holistically, like looking at the uh, entire spectrum about um, regardless of what drugs comes and goes, like what's happening. And uh, 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 people have studies have studied those um, uh, like other for other diseases, like for example for infectious diseases, for cancer. There have be, they have created models, they have created um, system dynamics approach to understand. Uh, what are the drivers, and uh, they have done that quite successfully, uh, successfully, uh, successfully. Um, and uh, like uh, examples for that is uh, the the Midas group um, uh, that uh, Don uh, is a part of, that have led uh, a national level uh, uh, policy uh, uh, evaluation and policy changes for uh, combating uh, epidemics, um, and. Uh, the other example is another group that's uh, uh, doing looking into cancer, S the CISNET group, uh, that's part, part of the National Institute for Health, that have for many, many years, they have uh, looked in, at a screening policy for cancer control and prevention. But unfortunately, we don't have such a center, we don't have such a, an effort, a national effort for combating the opioid epidemic. And I would love to uh, leave Don um, uh, to, to, um, yeah. uh, to, to add. To that comment. I'll, I'll, I'll even take a, a step back a little bit and point out that anytime you have an exponential growth uh, process, uh, there, there, there are a lot of exponential growth processes, a nuclear explosion or, or birth explosion or the like. Uh, and what happens with all of those, there's a positive feedback. There's a, something is generated that, that itself is, it accelerates the overall process. Uh, and so one of the first questions is, what are the positive feedback loops that are going on that can um, that manifest itself as an exponential increase in overdose deaths? Um, when we first saw this curve, the first thing that we thought of was Moore's Law. Uh, those of you who know about computers know that there is a law about the amount of computing that you can put on a square inch uh, has been uh, doubling every year and a half for the last 50 years. Uh, and, uh, and it's sort of like that, is that there is an exponential, and nobody has a real good ex explanation for Moore's law other than the fact that, that the demand is driving the expectations for the development, and that in turn supplies the, uh, the increased uh, computing power. Uh, so I, my, my intuition is it's something like that, is that there's a uh, a, a feedback loop of the uh, the demand is is increasing the market and the drug producers are increasing more drug as they go. But I'm not sure. I mean, there could be many other factors. As, and as Harry points out, the right way to approach this 
is systematically looking at data sets to look for the causative drivers. I mean, it, it would be great to, to get at what the drivers are and what is, is uh, causing that positive feedback loop. Um, and, and I think that this is a really important area for the federal government to take the lead on research um, and academic institutions throughout the country to, uh, to, to you know, roll up their sleeves and, and try to get to the bottom of this because it really is a national crisis. And the more we can understand it, the more we can target appropriate policies. Um, but in the absence of really understanding uh, fully why this is happening, what do you think the, the practical implications are um, for prevention programs and for demand reduction programs writ large? Um, it seems again that we have very a very compartmentalized view. Uh, oftentimes, Congress will pass legislation on uh, authorizing prevention dollars for a specific drug, um, and you know the the federal agencies will try the best as they can to sort of you know put that in a larger context um, so that states can um, have programs that are a little more comprehensive. But um, you know. You, I think in, in all of our planning for this session, we talked a lot about um, the historian David Musto and his book, The American Disease. And it seems like we do have an addiction crisis in this country. Um, and until we get to the bottom of what's causing us to numb ourselves as a society, uh, we won't really fix the problem. Um, so what do you think the implications are of your research for prevention programs and how should we make sure that we're addressing them um, in order to be responsive to your research findings. I'll go first. Uh, the uh, so the the first one is uh, is what I mentioned uh, by the you know, by um, not over interpreting a wobble uh, that uh, just because the curve has goes down after it's gone up um, doesn't necessarily mean we should declare victory. Um, nor does it give you necessarily the insights as to what were the reasons why that curve di dipped downwards. Uh, one of the things you'll note is that we have never had a sustained decrease that went below the expected exponential curve. So my first advice to policymakers is don't say anything until the curve dips below the expected exponential curve, uh, because it may well be you're just heading back to the expected rate uh, after a temporary aberration. And I think that's pretty important for prevention is that don't overinterpret success. Sure, you do everything you you can um, do this, you know, have smart people and dedicated people uh, working. And some of the times that's really going to, that's going to bend the curve. And one of these days it really will bend down. Uh, but it, but don't, uh, don't, um, don't pronounce victory too quickly. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the second is that this now gives you a, a tool for how to better evaluate preventive policies, is that if you know that, you know, that it, it's going to be an expected exponential curve, then you have to factor that into what, how you interpret the impact uh, of any specific intervention. And so my strong advice uh, to policymakers is to, uh, to assume an exponential growth uh, and then analyze your results in that context. Now, and, and at the same time, by the way, being aware that there's an annual cycle and being aware that there is a, a monthly cycle. So when you look at an effect and you implement it for one year and you see the results go down, you may just be looking at the annual cycle effect. So those are the kind of things that it, it will tell you. I wish I could tell you that it tells me what is the right prevention, what is the best prevention. I think my interpretation is that that uh, we have to look at the societal drivers. Uh, we have to look at these issues that whether or not they have been called uh, the uh, uh, the lack of of purpose, the lack of well-being, sense of despair. Um, there, a lot of these things I think are are intimately related to drug overdose deaths. Uh, but exactly which ones, exactly how they are, and exactly how to intervene, um, I think is still a, a set of unknowns. Yeah, and, and you can understand the inclination of a policymaker to want to declare victory because there is such a, um, we are in such a moment of crisis and we wanna cling on to any sign of hope that we can find. 
Um, so, you know, I, I hope if anyone in, in either of the, the past White House or the current White House watching, um, you know, doesn't think that we're we're picking on them. Um, you know, it is the kind of thing that we we want to find those glimmers of hope and we want to make sure that we're um you know uh sort of making the public aware that things are going in the right direction for, for once. But again, your data shows that that may be short lived. Yeah, I think it's fine to say it's heading in the right direction and we should celebrate that anytime we see that. But just don't assume that that means that we're, we've got a long term fix. Right. Yeah. And if I if I may add uh, to that point is that uh, like looking into a, a uh, uh, the exponential trajectory provides a context uh, like before, because if if you look at to uh, the uh, like annual changes, like year to year changes, it's like, you know, that dimension is very easy to to be misled by the trend and celebrate too early. But having the commercial trajectory and looking at what to compare uh, the curve against provides a context. And it's very important. I, I think one point I would like to add is uh, for resource allocation. If, if uh, rates go down, uh, people might conceive that this is due to policy X or policy Y being working. But what a fact it is, it's just a return. It went, um, it went, it was part of a wobble, went up and then it's now coming down. Uh, so like uh, knowing exactly why, what the driver of it going up first and then coming down can help uh, can help guide those policies as well. Like it can help people and policymakers uh, make better judgment and also uh, uh, allocate resources on the long term about how much they should allocate for prevention versus treatment uh, versus law enforcement and, to, and those. So I just want to point, uh, point out that. That's that's a great point. And and speaking of wobbles, uh, let's dig a little deeper into one of the wobbles you, you point out, um, which was the 2017 carfentanyl um, supply reduction. Um, you know, there uh, should we take from that that if we can radically reduce the supply, then it will have an impact on an outsized impact on on overdose deaths. You want to go? Uh, sure, I can. So uh, yes, if we if we can, if we can control the supply, uh, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, so the the change in the carfentanil wobble was uh, was uh, mostly due to the regulation in, uh, in China. Uh, so China controlled uh, and regulated carfentanil. Uh, so before that it was not regulated. So we saw the rapid increase, and then afterwards, after China controlled it almost immediately, uh, we saw the decline in the U.S. So the answer is, if we can do something like that for fentanyl. And yes, absolutely. But if but we need to be realistic about how much control we really do have over fentanyl. Uh, Don? No, I completely agree that you know, that that was, in fact, uh, I I don't we we portray it as a, the wobble as a uh, is a sort of a on top of the exponential curve. But that does represent a success. It was a limited success. But but what they the, what we're trying to point out is. The limited successes are just that, that there's an underlying process that is going to continue and we have to be continually vigilant and, and not overestimate the effects of one particular intervention. Right, right. And, and it's definitely a, an intervention that's difficult to sustain. Yeah. Um, switching gears for a second, uh, one of the most troubling aspects of your presentation was on the youth word shift. Um, and in, in one of your prior papers, you mentioned that the average age was at 1.30, and now we're hovering around 18 as that adolescent barrier. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that and, and uh, you know, how fentanyl is, is perhaps maybe a little bit different than other substances in accelerating that, that youth word trajectory? Uh, yeah, so um, that is correct. That about 20, 25 years ago, the the, the lower boundary of, of of overdose deaths it was in the high twenties, around thirty, uh, and and it was staying there for a while. And then it was about 20, 25 years ago that it that the that the uh, it dropped to around uh, eighteen, and it's pretty much stayed there for the last until the last few years. And as and as uh, Harry pointed out, it looks like it. We're worried that that adolescent barrier is being broken. One way to think about that um, is that um, the epidemic, it's hard to sustain exponential growth. That if the exponential growth is going to continue, 
where are those users going to come from? Um, and one way to do is have more users at every age group. But the other one is to have more users at age groups that we're not previously using. Uh, and one of our real fears is that the dynamics of the exponential growth are going to dictate that one of two things is going to have to happen. Either you know, the older ages are going to have to continue to increase their use and death rates, or and or, and or both, uh, that the youthward shift will break the uh, adolescent barrier uh, and we'll see more users and more deaths. And that uh, that is a, um, a terrifying proposition. Corey, anything you want to add? Um, uh, no, I completely agree with Don's. So I think um, uh, the the um, the problem, if you think about it as a market, as a demand and supply, you have to think about about the process, about how uh, uh, like there are the um, the uh, like uh, the drug uh, cartels and the drug uh, suppliers that they are depending on the sustaining the exponential curve from this from the supply side, and because uh, the, they have to maintain their their um, uh, the, the, their market, and they have to to make a, a distribution for that. And if you if you think about like how the different um, like age groups have been uh, targeted, which is uh, becoming like like a dance, like it's uh, horrifying because uh, fentanyl is becoming more lethal, it becomes more accessible, it becomes more available, um, and um, uh, it's highly addictive. Uh, so um, so so yeah, it's like it's a it's a it's a dangerous uh, situation. Indeed. Um, I'd love to turn to some of the questions in the Q&A and encourage anyone um, to, to add questions in if, if things come to mind that they want to ask about. Um, there are a couple questions about whether or not this is a uniquely American phenomenon or if we're seeing similar things in other countries. Can you speak to that a bit? How are you want to do that? Uh, sure, yeah. sure. So we have now looked into other countries extensively. There are some similarities in certain European countries. Uh, I think uh, uh, like uh, Ireland and um, uh, like some of the Scandinavian countries do have similar rates, but the rates are not are lower than uh, the United States. And, uh, and the same uh, thing uh, uh, applies like the, uh, the exponential growth. Uh, so when I say like the pattern is that the exponential trajectory, that's what I mean that is similar in some other countries as well, but the rates are much higher in the United, uh, in the United States. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, Don, I don't know if you have looked into that. Yeah, so, the, uh, we, um, so the, that this is one of the good ways to get at you know, what is driving the exponential growth process to do these cross-country comparisons. And to, you know, when you just are looking at the United States, it'll be good to have countries to compare. And Hare said there are some other countries that do or don't have what appears to be exponential processes that are lower than ours, but may, may well have the same feedback loops that could be identified. Another question we have in the chat is about whether the data are, um, uh, are only national, uh, whether the trend is only national, or if we also see this at the regional level. Have you been able to break down any of this data in any way and, and look at particular regions or areas of the country? I'll defer to my Canadian colleague on this one. <laughs> US, but yes, yes. Uh, so um, absolutely. So in the in the science paper, um, and I, I believe it's still publicly available. Uh, but if not, we will be happy to provide a copy. But we did we looked extensively into this. So we looked into the trends both in by different geographies um, and uh, by different drug type and the combination of all of those. And the details are all there in that paper. Um, uh, so this is, this is a good question. So that was really puzzling to us uh, because on the surface, at the national level, we see the exponential growth. But when you break it down by uh, regions, by you break it down by drug type, we don't see the pattern as much. And which which makes us wonder like why? Like why is uh, a process that works in, uh, nationally as exponential, uh, when you break it down, it's, it doesn't behave that way. Like, what are the drives that holds it all up together uh, to expand uh, any exponential trajectory? But there are uh, certainly some some places, some regions in the U.S. do behave similar to exponential. But the overall, the answer uh, it's not it's not well defined as as the national level. Okay. 
So does that mean that that one region might be offsetting another? So if the yes. northeast is going up, the exactly. southeast may be going down. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Then the next region later on uh, catches up. So the example is like the the, the migration when the opioid in the Appalachia happened, and then uh, and then gradually my fentanyl uh, like with heroin, and then fentanyl, and then fentanyl moved to the west. But all of that, when you add it all up, it creates the exponential trajectory. Yes. And, and is that how other epidemics work as well that you see in other areas of public health? Great question. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, there does always tend to be focality or uh, on epidemics. Some places are hotter than others because of their local population density or local other environmental factors. So, uh, but sometimes it's just bad luck. Sometimes it's the, epi the virus just landed in Seattle first or that, you know, that kind of thing, not anything specific about the population there. So, uh, so yes, it is in the early stages of most epidemics, you do see a fair amount of heterogeneity, but then it tends to smooth out over time as, you know, this, um, the chance effects give way to the, the overall averaging effects. Another question in the chat was about um, race and ethnicity and and socioeconomic factors. Have you been able to to break the the data down along those lines and and see if there are differences among among various groups? Yeah, I'll uh, say so I can take a uh, first stab at that. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, so there is uh, definitely um, uh, like patterns. And again, like I'll refer. Uh, the the um, uh, the audience to the science paper as well. Uh, so in that we looked at two different ways, at least what was documented, um, uh, like in the uh, in the center, centers for disease control and prevention uh, definition of race. Uh, but you can see like the the patterns by race is very different. So it used to be the crack cocaine among blacks, and you can see that pattern continuing, uh, really um, uh, increasing in 2006, and then gradually uh, slowing down. But among Blacks, the patterns are different uh, than among Whites. Whites were mostly prescription opioid at the beginning, but while Blacks were uh, were uh, cocaine. Uh, and um, and uh, th 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 those patterns do change quite a bit by different ethnic group. But again, going back to the exponential trajectory and the role of fentanyl, when you add all of this together, it creates an exponential trajectory. So it makes you wonder, uh, what's the driver? Like, what is the mechanism in which, like, uh, that crosses not only um, uh, spatial barriers, like not only geographical barriers, but actually crosses different um, uh, eth uh, ethnic uh, barriers as well. Um, uh, so that th this is the thing that we are wondering about, like um, uh, what are drivers, what are the mechanisms that holds all of these groups together? Um, I don't know, Don, if you wanna. Yeah, yeah, so uh, it, that, uh, and the, the message here is that these patterns are shifting over time. So there isn't any one pattern. And so when you say that the drug problem is a problem at a given location, if you look over time, there have been um, the um, changes from the ratio of white to black, changes in the sex ratio, changes in the, in particular, very prominent urban to rural change, and then some swing back again. So these are, you know, these changes are going on all the time. That would be, a, a that's a, another fascinating lecture we could give and show some nice, data on it, but the general point is that yes, these are changing over time, just like the drug usage patterns are changing over time. Yeah, I mean, that's what makes this so uh, fascinating, right? That, that, that they're below that that uh, pitched line, there's all sorts of variation, but it all adds up to, to being that exponential yeah. growth curve. What about the shift now to um, more synthetics? So, you know, it makes, uh, supply reduction harder, right? It's harder to manage the flow of synthetics into the United States. It's hard to do things like we used to do with crop, crop eradication in various countries. That sort of is off the table. Um, you know, sometimes there are willing partners in the international community uh, with regard to uh, controlling some of the precursor chemicals. Sometimes there aren't willing partners. Um, and so it seems like the supply is only going to get worse. It seems like the lethality of these substances is getting worse. Um, and it seems like the sort of the halo of it 
can be pressed into uh, what looks like a pill and looks like something you would get at your local pharmacy, um, you know, makes the, the, the teen user particularly um, less skeptical about the substance and, and sort of decreases the barrier to entry for them. So do you think that the, uh, the increase in synthetics will uh, change this, this curve in any way? Would it, I mean, God forbid, make it worse? So I, I, yeah, I think this change to synthetics is an inherent part of the curve. Uh, and in fact, one of the ways to think about the curve is that it does reflect the improving technologies for production, uh, delivery, and use of drugs. Uh, and I mentioned the analogy to the Moore's Law in computer chips. Well, that was a technology that continued to grow, and it grew exponentially because the technologies grew uh, to feed the demand. Um, and I suspect that that's what's going on here, too, on the drug side, going from plant-based to semi-synthetic to synthetic to more efficient uses of synthetics. Uh, the a worrisome area will be uh, what's going to happen to the delivery mechanisms. Um, Intravenous use is not terribly efficient. It's efficient to get a high, but it's not an easy way to use drugs. Um, and so are there going to be alternative ways of delivering the technology will make it worse? Is that some of the things we should be worried about? Um, and there are other background technologies in terms of the communications uh, and the uh, ability to, uh, to, to track your shipments and all the things that are essentially part of the, you know, the cartel business side of things. And those are technology dependent as well. So I, my guess is that yes, that this is not, not ended yet and the technologies are gonna to continue to feed the process. Um, a, a final question for you, because our, our time is, is coming to an end. Um, if, if there was a takeaway that you wanted policymakers, but also the national media to have in terms of how they talk about drug epidemics, uh, what would it be? Um, I, I think that the main point is that the, the drugs, drug overdose deaths have been increasing on an exponential trajectory. Um, and we saw that. 37 uh, years ago um, and said that that uh, it would continue to go along that trajectory and it has. So I you know I can't say absolutely it's proven that it will continue along an exponential trajectory for the next 20 or 30 years, but I'm worried it will. Uh, that when we saw this in 2015, the data through 2015 reported on it in 2017, that uh, that we weren't sure that the curve would continue. And what I remember saying to each other is, if you were betting and you had 37 years of continuous predictable growth from year to year, what would you bet on for the next year? And you would bet on that for the next year, but how far into the future that's gonna... So that's my main message is be aware that this is a process and factor that into your policy and policy analyses. Yeah, and if I, if I add to that, just related is that, um... Don't celebrate too early. Like, don't look into year-to-year -year changes, but look into the overall long-term uh, uh, changes. Like, how how is it changing? And um, and think outside the box. Like, think about uh, interventions and strategies that you have not tried. And like, because if you repeat the same thing that has been tried over and over again um, for different drugs, uh, like, what are the chances of success? Uh, so, uh, so yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I, I think that that your your data really show that um, we need to have a different approach, um, and uh, we need to really understand, as you said, the drivers of this, because I think that's really key to getting a handle on on this exponential growth. And you know, we've been talking about all of this as data and policy, um, but you know, I think if we take off our data hats and put on our family hats um, and, uh, and, and think about the implications for families across the country, I mean, it's really devastating. Um, and I think that the, the other takeaway for parents and families can be that this crisis is, um, is not going away anytime soon. And, you know, we really need to double down on making sure that we're talking to our kids 
that we're checking on their mental health. We're making sure that they have good coping strategies as they get into high school and, and go to college, that they know about harm reduction, um, that they um, really have the tools that they need to survive this, this epidemic. Um, and uh, this is really important research and I, I can't thank you enough for, for being with us here today. Um, we've had a number of questions in the chat about whether or not the, the, this will be recorded, um, and it will be. Um, you'll be able to get access to it on the National Fentanyl Awareness Day website, as well as the Song for Charlie website. Um, and we thank both National Fentanyl Awareness Day, uh, the, the, the people behind that, and, and the folks at Song for Charlie for really um, helping to, to bring this conversation to us today. Um, we'll also be sending out a survey for feedback, as well as additional resources. So stay tuned in your inbox, follow Song for Charlie and National Fennel Awareness Day on social media. And thank you so much for your participation. Thank you for having us. Thanks everyone. Thank you everybody. Bye. -bye. Bye.